Welcome back to another episode of Unscripted Exchanges. Hayden, I am absolutely fired up tonight. We uh, have a guest on here, Jonathan Levine. He is a entrepreneur. He's got a PhD. A dude's been all over the world speaking about sustainability, manufacturing. Uh, he's the CEO of a company called Folia Materials. Uh, I don't want to butcher exactly what they do because they got their hands in a lot of things. But I will say that uh, I met Jonathan a few years ago through my work with Parity Water and the and the sustainable water uh, and aquaculture uh, industry. And he has been been doing nothing but changing the way we look at paper products. Uh, and I'm just really excited to have you all here, man. Thanks for having me. Did I do a good job with that introduction? I don't know. Like I felt like I was gassing you up enough. Like there's so much more I could have said, but I hope you I hope you like that. I I we, we shared something in common. I have in fact lived in Cincinnati for several months. No way. When? Yeah. We we lived there in 2018 for a few months. Okay. Really? What yeah, what right, part right, of town right, were about, you in? Right about let's see, so six years ago, we would have been walking through the gaslight district to get some uh some graders walking through okay. the snow the graders right about now. Yep. <laughs> Still one of our all-time favorite ice cream spots. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yes, yes. Graders is a hometown hometown hero. We'll favorite. have to send you some graders after the show. Wait, yeah. what about Skyline too? Oh, we could send them some canned Skyline. Do you like Skyline? Do you ever have that? Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The city Cincinnati cleanse, of course. Oh, uh, the Cincinnati cleanse. Is that what you said? <laughs> That's funny. That's funny, man. So it sounds like thumbs up to graders. Maybe thumbs down to Skyline. I'm still a fan. Okay, <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, dude, you're getting ready for the beach. You just throw some skyline in the <laughs> throw, throw some skyline in the oven, and you're good to go. Skyline dip, man. That's a cleanse. That's a full colon cleanse. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. I actually, uh, I actually did. Uh, have you ever done skyline dip? I know we're getting off. Time. Have you ever done skyline dip before? No. Oh my. Okay, we're we're packaging it up. I sent some. I have a client out in Kansas City, and we sent a four pack of skyline to. And I sent her the Skyline Dip recipe. You had that before, haven't you? No, it's delicious. Unbelievable. I mean, I mean, you you know, it's like probably fifteen thousand calories a serving, but it's absolutely it's like absolutely worth it. So, um, anyways, I don't know how we got on that. Oh, because you lived in Cincinnati, uh, but we're, we're man, we're just excited to have you on here. Cool. Thanks for having me. Are, are you guys based in Cincinnati or Dayton? We're in Cincinnati. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to kick it off as we're getting into this and give you the opportunity, uh, Jonathan, to tell us a little bit about Folia Materials. I think you mentioned Folia Worldwide or Folia Global as well. I'd love to just kind of let you talk about, you know, what Folia Materials is, uh, Folia Global, and just maybe, you know, give us a high level view of, of why you started, uh, started that business and got into that. Yeah, the, um, my, my wife and co-founder's PhD was uh, inventing a kind of paper that makes clean drinking water. And then somebody goes and makes a whole advertisement about her as NGO and she becomes world famous. It gets her, her 15 months of fame, like BBC Most Read, Time Magazine, Invention of the Year, the whole thing. Which, which by the way, it turns up in entrepreneurship land, that's not uncommon. It, it turns out that's one of the patterns is some PhD invented a thing it gets picked up by the media. There's a whole lot of attention. All of a sudden you're like, hey, wait a minute, there's enough going on. So we get pulled in. What we learned is the pattern is we got pulled into the market, right? We end up getting flown to China, meeting Coca-Cola there, meeting Unilever China. Terry's a paid celebrity for Unilever China in 2016. And and so like we get pulled into 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 having this, we're like, all right, what does a full-time gig look like? We learned about social enterprise. We learned about impact. And, and sort of the for-profit, you know, we're a couple scientists. So we learn, we start to learn all the business model theory and all this kind of stuff. And, and it starts as this 20 cent, 20 liter water purifier. Okay. So we start as folio water. We, we then, as we get into it, go, the stuff that people are saying doesn't, doesn't line up because, because we're, we're two things at the same time. We're an invention around paper chemistry and green chemistry. So my PhD is carbon sequestration. My wife's PhD is green chemistry. And using, how do you use paper? So Canadian government wanted to know, Canadian government, Canadian paper industry said, how do we take, you know, trees, paper, how do we get something more value at, right? Those are declining industries. 
how do we do something more valuable? So that's Terry's PhD at McGill. She goes and invents this kind of paper. I said, well, we're a technology company, right? It's a chemistry thing, but but it's got a use case that goes and creates a new product. It creates a new market. It creates a new category. And we have to go 100 years back to Procter & Gamble and to Unilever and to Clorox for these iconic companies. Well, all of them have these material sciences inventions. Mm -hmm. right? Procter & Gamble is some of the most patents of any company on the planet. But but people think of it as like this mass market consumer goods company, but but the R and D function there is through the roof, right? Same and so we realize, okay, we've got an invention which is a hammer, and we've got a, a use case which is a nail, which is the water filter. And so folio materials is the technology use case. The water filter gets spun out as folio water global, is on sale in two thousand stores in Bangladesh. We have a Bangladeshi CEO who's a serial CEO. He's he's a consumer goods, you know, sort of the He's ex-British American tobacco, which is, you know, the, the Procter & Gamble global equivalent, right? So he's an expert in consumer goods. And so he leads the commercialization expert in South Asia for mass wow. marketing consumer goods. And then now we've got this materials company and we get pulled over to, to microwave food packaging by one of the, the top five frozen food companies. And now, by the way, we're contacting the same kinds of packaging firms that are in Cincinnati because they make, they, right? It's all the same thing, right? Right. So, we were in Cincinnati to learn what there was to know about what Procter & Gamble had done 20 years earlier. And so we moved to Cincinnati in 2018 to learn what had been done in Procter & Gamble in 1999 to 2001. Okay. That was why we moved there. The only way to find out what had happened 20 years earlier was to move there for three months and find the people who did the work 20 years earlier, which we did. And we talked. That... Isn't that awesome? It's fascinating. It, it absolutely is. Well, there's a lot, a lot. Obviously, Jonathan, the jump to 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 jump in there. Um, the the first question I'm going to ask is this: probably not what you would have thought I was going to ask. I'm throw about you, but was it a surreal feeling when all of a sudden you went from you know it was just this this like you said your wife's except her wife's PhD product right PhD uh a project. And all of a sudden, you guys are like, you know, you're you're becoming famous, right? She's becoming famous. She's all over the place. It was it like surreal. I mean, what did that feel like? What were you thinking in that moment? Ter Terry gets off the plane in China at one point, and she said, "There's all these lines of people. They want to take photos with me, and they they want my they want my signature on paper." And, and like three days in a row, she's like, "They want they want photographs with me, and they they want, you know." She she's super introverted. She she's quiet. And she's like, all these people are, you know, they keep coming around me and like, like they want my signature. And I'm like, Terry, are you signing a contract? Like check, like what, what are you signing? He's like, you know, it's pieces of paper. And then they want, they want, I'm like, Terry, those are called selfies and those are called autographs. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so the story goes viral. It's number one. So, so the, the Terry goes to American chemical society meeting presents at the chemistry meeting, her stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a, a BBC reporter who's got a PhD from Oxford, who does a fabulous job, writes up a great story. It ends up like we're at a bar at a speakeasy in Boston because, you know, it's, it's what you, as one does. And then one of her friends uh, texts her and she's like, hey, you're on, you're on the BBC. She's like, oh, cool. The thing must have come out, right? Like you think like, ah, oh, it's going to be in the science section or something, right? Right. Like, you know, your story's in the front page of BBC News. Wow. And we're like, holy crap. So we look and then it goes from being like number 10 most, most read, which definitely deserved a round. I mean, it was a slamming cocktails at the speakeasy, right? Right. And so then like it climbs the ladder, like when it hits like number five or number three most read, we definitely have to get another round, you know? Now when it hit number one most read, we had had several rounds. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're like, holy smokes, right? Terry's number one most read on BBC News. Like that's, right? So we wake up the next morning and, and phone's over there, Terry's over there. They're calling. Who's they? The BBCs. There's more than one. Three different parts of the BBC were calling to interview her again. She ends up in Time Magazine and like, so yeah, it was like, we didn't know what to do, right? We're like, we're, you know, like, so we got to like rush over to my, my friend who's a professor at Northeastern and like, we're like, hey, can we, can we set up in your conference room or something? We got to, Terry's got a call with, uh, she's going to be live on BBC World right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, she's like, you know, like, where, where do I put my hands for a, for a video call? Like BBC <laughs> News, got, like, BBC World is going to have me on a video. She's like, where do I like? You know, like, how do I sit? Like, how, you know, like, what do I say? Like, yeah, no, super surreal. <laughs> but, but, but you know what? Uh, Terry was really introverted. The reason she did it 
which he said no one will ever know about the invention otherwise. It'll it'll be some academic thing that no one ever hears about otherwise. Right. So so she so 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 my wife is as much an entrepreneur as anybody, right? She was like, look, um, you know, this ad agency wanted to do a video about her, and she was like, yeah, we got to do it. And then and then all this TV stuff that she was like. Uh, it's nerve wracking to be on television. There's a TV, there's Klieg lights, there's all this kind of stuff. Right. And she's super quiet. She's introverted. She's quiet. And she was like, I'm going to do it because otherwise no one will ever know. Wow. And that's how it began. I mean, that's, that's how it began, right? That's it. Yeah. That's quite the story. And I, I'm loving everything that you're sharing there. I'm going to kind of take us in a slightly different direction. Um, I mean, it's all related. It sounds like Folia Materials, you have quite a few um, or at least a couple of different product lines. Do you have like just personally a preference in the product line that most interests you or the one that's probably best performing and definitely not looking for like specific numbers, but just out of curiosity, you know, it sounds like you've got a few different product lines. Which one do you like and which one's doing best? Do you speak to any of that? So, so we've looked at probably a hundred different ways of going to market. We've looked at at least a dozen non-overlapping use cases. I mean, uh, antiviral vacuum filter, uh, Legionella in buildings, uh, you know, all, all sorts of unusual things. Um, cause, cause people would come to us and they're we were like, well, you're a, you're a $50 billion company. If you want to write a check for that, we could, we would, we would entertain, uh, right. you, know, <laughs> you want, if you want us, you want, you want us to develop it. Like, you're going to pay for us to do some patented work. Wait, we'll, we'll patent it and we'll, we'll charge you money for us to do that. We're, we're open to that as a concept, right? You'll, you'll buy a whole lot of it. We, you know, we can do that. Um, so look, the original use case, I'll, I'll come back to it in a second. So we, we got, uh, 2018, we, we sort of methodically did this through plug and play. We looked at antiviral touch surfaces and things like that. We made antiviral tape at the start of COVID with a big company. We, we ended up making antiviral face masks because we thought we were going to contribute to COVID. And so mm. my biggest disappointment was we made antiviral three-ply face masks that killed 99.97% of SARS-CoV-2 in one hour, got fully third-party tested, certified, approved in the United Kingdom, and went nowhere. Because apparently better actual technical performing face masks was not in the cards. Politics was, right? I mean, I mean right. asking people to, to politely wear a mask turned out to be... right. So that, that's the sort of negative side. Um, we got pulled over into microwave food packaging. Uh, can, you say, said, can you repeat that again? What is it? Microwave food packaging. Microwave food pa Okay. So, so we're at plug and play and a, and a top five frozen food company says, you solve the holy grail of what, what we do, what we're looking for. Like it's a 20 year problem, holy grail. And, and, and I said, really? Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and they're like, the metal in your paper the microwaves are going to heat it and, and the metal is going to convert the microwaves into heat. And then the paper can soak up. you got a water filter. You can soak up and move the water and move the grease. And I was like, well, that, that second part is true. And, and I checked with Terry and I was like, oh, it turns out she, during her PhD, she used microwaves to do the synthesis. So it turns out she knew that was true. But what I actually told him at the time was you're messing with me using more colorful language. I was like, great, you're a $50 billion company. And now, now, now you came to a startup event to mess with me. Like you think I'm going to solve the holy grail of microwave food packaging. <laughs> okay. So anyway, it turns out they were right. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you ask me, which do I care about more? Look, the, prop, the, the big entrepreneurial challenge here is we do industrial manufacturing. So, so one industrial roll of our paper, so it's a pallet wide, it's 40 inches. It's as tall as your shoulders or as your head height, depending on the size of roll. And we're talking about a million packages, right? So we're talking about, look, we, we could replace a billion package, packages or billions of packages with paper instead of plastic, right? Right. It turns out startup land doesn't know about paper and doesn't really care about paper packaging. Everybody talks about sustainable packaging, but but we're, we're, we're a niche and we're like, oh yeah, yeah, no, there's a billion dollars worth of this plastic microwave susceptor sold a year, just, just in microwave susceptors. And then it's a niche and it's a billion units. And you're like, consumer, consumer end products people get. But so, so but I don't care as much because it's, it's a billion units of, of paper instead of plastic a year, but I care a lot more about a billion humans having clean, safe drinking water mm -hmm. than I do about, I, I have a PhD in earth and environmental engineering, but, but I only did that for the human side and the human side of actually solving the problem of drinking mm -hmm. water to me is that's why we get out of bed that the part where we could have a billion 
paper, not plastic, and we'd have a lot less environmental pollution. I, no, I, I, I got to tell you, uh, saving a billion people from safe drinking water sounds like uh, a bit more direct. But right, my, my round, my my lesser important one is uh, <laughs> still industrial. So you know. <laughs> Well, it sounds go ahead. You go ahead, Bruce. No, I mean, just hearing all that, that, that totally makes sense. I mean, at the same time, it, it sounds like you do have a good moral compass though, in terms of, uh, thinking about providing, uh, you know, the most impact and, and value out there to the world. I wanted to kind of circle back real quick to one other call out that you had mentioned with you guys developing, you know, the face mask and for political reasons and probably other reasons too didn't end up really turning out to be, uh, you know, the, the long-term move, how would you respond or what, what advice would you give to people that either have products that don't ever fully go to market or go to market and then don't end up, you know, operating well in the long term? What, what advice would you have to share around that? Here's, an anti here's a box of antiviral face masks. Nice. For, for for six cents a face mask, we can make every single face mask in the world antiviral. Wow. Um, here's the N95 equivalent. It's just a prototype sitting in a drawer. Um, the, look, the nature of a startup uh, at like a theory level is there's supposed to be a new technology. And, and I think the key piece there is that the vast majority of so-called startups are not startups. Mm. Um, my, my, my poor wife has to hear me complain every time the newspaper refers to Facebook as a startup. Oh my word. Okay. I, I'll raise my hand. That drives me absolutely nuts, dude. Or, 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 or when a software company is called a technology company. <laughs> right. Right. I, totally. Just, just, just hear me out here. Hear, hear me out here. Computer programming. Yeah. They, they did that back in the sixties and seventies and even in the eighties and um, <laughs> hardware, same thing. Um, do you know that best practices statistics also was done in the seventies and eighties? We call that AI machine learning based, uh, enabled software, hardware hybrid now and, and best practices, <laughs> best practice, statistical solutions is a thing. And that's all we mean when we say machine learning and train segmentation was a thing back in the eighties. Now we can get much better results now, but like. <laughs> They're so, just repackaging or rebranding it with some slightly different yeah. words, right? To make it sound like it's com completely new. It's like, no, some of those fundamental things have been around. It's just, you know, the way that they're, they're marketing it and so how they spend models. things. Like very few AI and machine learning companies are technology companies. Mm. Most of them are operating entities that are going to utilize somebody else's best practices and go and execute on making a product. And usually it's a software product. And then they're going to make that into a business. And like, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But now you're just a, a rapid growth small business, a, a, a small business has potential for rapid growth into a relatively new market. And it's just a relatively new market, which is why you can do that rapid growth. If it was mature, look, if I take, if I take AI and machine learning over into accounting software, presumably lots of people can do this. And if I happen to be early, I can grow quickly. But if I go 10 years out from now, why wouldn't people know how to do this? It's right. This is what best practices software is that right so very few technology companies or technology companies so there's something about a startup that makes it special and it might be hey nobody is doing that we're going to be the first one to do that business model um there's a really neat neat book called uh worthless impossible stupid uh dan eisenberg who's who's over at babson entrepreneurship program and he talks about these people who are, who are doing category creations and one of them was multiplexes in mexico okay Really, Mexico had like the sticky floor, single, single theater movies. And these guys were like, we're going to have 15, uh, we're going to have 15 multiplexes, you know, a big multiplex with all the modern stuff. Hey, that's, that is absolutely entrepreneurship. They were the first ones to do it in an entire country, right? Um, Grameen phone launched cell phones into Bangladesh and they, they created sort of the, the SIM card, the, the little penny, you know, the, the super cheap ones, right? So all those things are entrepreneurship. So why do things fail? Things fail because the technology didn't work. Things fail because people, it turns out, weren't interested. And it, it turns out that right now, antiviral PPE and, and doing a better job actually dealing with that problem, right? Look, we're, we're post-COVID. I still go to conferences, including public health conferences, and people still don't wash their hands. <laughs> right before they eat, you're like, you're in the middle of eating, you're shaking their hands, no one's washing their hands. So, you know. What can you do? 
It's a crazy world we live in. Well, I, what, what I think, what I think is interesting, Jonathan, is is hearing your take on like, I mean, I I knew you would have some some just really fresh perspectives on a few things, or 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 I would call them like you know, I would say I don't know, super hot takes, but I mean, talking specifically about technology, I just think that was super interesting because you know, to me, I think when we all these days, a lot of people think about technology, they truly do think about software, right, or hardware or some sort of AI, they're thinking about something that's got to have like robotic arms, right? Or it's got to have like something that, you know, that's on your phone. But, but I think robot, technology robot, is robot about robot advancement. What? Robotic arms are, robotic arms are 1970. I'm just, what, what I'm getting at, what I'm getting at is that I think technology and, and technology advancement and technology, um, you know, innovation is, is it so much just like a, phys, a phone or something that's actually, working with electric like it's not just that you can be you can be advancing technology through stuff like your folia materials right through the what you guys have done or through your microwave packaging that's not a that's not a it's not connected to the internet of things you know what i mean so so not everything is software and and, and remember that the the original the original revolution was the industrial revolution and the original telecom the the, the, the single biggest invention for telecom is the the telegraph wire because it's the right. first time you've got beyond horizon communication. It's the telegraph wire. Right. A anytime you say, like, this is the biggest advancement, you're like, no, 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 the telegraph wire. Like, all of a sudden, we can talk thousands of miles apart. There's not a single other invention that that's going to compete with, like, the telegraph wire. And, and, and look, that's that's 1860s to 1890s, like, mm -hmm. metals, like, you get gets a steel. But but look, the, 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 the key, the core part of that is... There's technology and there's entrepreneurship and there's technology entrepreneurship. And, and both of those are totally fine. You just have to be careful. Which of these things are we doing? Are we just using things? There's nothing wrong with taking stuff that everybody's using and saying, I can do a better job making the business using those things. That's entrepreneurship. Yeah. So it's still entrepreneurship, but, but tech, I'm a technologist. It turns out, you know, the whole, I've got a PhD and blah, blah, blah. Like I don't think of it, but like my, my wife, apparently her Amazon account goes back to 1997. I was at one of the first eight universities that was on Facebook. I'm like the first whatever user of Facebook. It's just because my friends down the down the hall were using it, but it turns out maybe not, right? Like, so there's the technologist piece and there's the entrepreneurship piece. And then we were in Silicon Valley in 2017. And so some of the stuff I'm telling you about is is actually what the professional people who were technologists and entrepreneurs, and all I'm doing is telling you what's was actually really accepted professional knowledge mm -hmm. in the field of technology entrepreneurs. Right, right. Like, I'm not saying anything new in any of this. I'm just saying that's that's apparently what what the smart people who do this professionally say to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Jonathan, what I'm hearing you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm probably oversimplifying, but you know, you, you could club entrepreneurs into two categories. And yeah, I'm, I'm definitely oversimplifying. There's entrepreneurs that end up finding, you know, opportunities out there in the market to make something, you know, bigger and better like that. Those ideas kind of already existing, but they're building upon, you know, value. And then there's entrepreneurs that are, you know, finding new technologies and kind of bringing something to the world that's completely innovative. And I, I would say almost net new, um, which you could debate. Would, would, is that kind of what you're highlighting at or, or not, not quite? There's a lot of things that qualifies entrepreneurship. The, sure. the, the, I think it's the majority, like greater than 50% of entrepreneurs in the United States are franchisees and mm. own small restaurants or other shops. Yep. They're franchise owners. They're entrepreneurs. They own their yeah. own business. They're taking a risk. That's absolutely entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. My point is there's a lot of types of entrepreneurship and there's a lot of types of, and then there's, there's technology. And then the reason a, a startup usually has some sort of risk component. And so one of those components didn't work out and that's okay. Mm. That, that, if it's execution, then okay, then that might be on you. And then the question is, that could be fine. It could be that somebody else paid for you to get some lessons and now go and make your next thing and take those lessons and, and learn a lot from it. And it, that's okay too. It could be that it was crowded. It could be, it was the idea. It could be, it was the technology. It could be that technology in that market. So, so I'm mentoring somebody who's, who's trying to they, they've created a, a way of geotagging and having solving the disinformation and misinformation problem for like war torn Syria, uh, Turkey after the earthquakes. And so citizen journalists can upload content 
where you know that it's authentic. You don't have somebody lying about being bombed in Syria. You know, somebody's like, no, 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 that's actually the earthquake in Turkey, things like that, right? And it works in it. But, but, but she had to walk away from it because had making a business out of that, she went to all the media companies. She, she talked to a number of very large name brand firms and, and they said no. And it's like, so she's beating herself up on it. And like, she didn't do anything wrong. She, she executed. She talked to the people. She networked like hell. She, she built a product. She got people on the product. She got content onto the product. She got some very small sales. And she can't possibly make it sustainable because that market sucks. And, right. and that market didn't see it for that particular use case. And like, yeah, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That That's the, the hypothesis of a startup is that these things will be true. And some of the answer is 95% of the time, one of those things wasn't true. So it closes down. You bring up a lot of thought provoking, uh, you know, concepts, ideas, whatever you want to categorize it as. And I just want to kind of get a, a deeper take and maybe I should use a different word, but in your mind, Jonathan, how do you de define the word innovation? And then part two to that, do you think that innovation is kind of stagnant, growing, or declining? And I know that's kind of a loaded question, but if you want to attempt to throw out some of your, you know, expertise and even just personal opinions, would love to hear that. So, people usually think about technical innovation. Yep. Um, but you know, business business models and organizational models and how things work. Right. Uh, Salesforce, he used to have protest marches saying, get rid of application software, have software as a service. And so the invention of software as a service is a business model. I mean, OK, it's, it's a re small recurring payment that's been done elsewhere uh, to take it full circle. We now have people who go, oh, it's 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 platform as a service. And so people are like, what if you do manufacturing as a service? Or like that's called contract manufacturing. It's been around. For <laughs> right, right. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, so there's different kinds of innovation, right? We work in emerging market impact among a lot of other things, right? And so there's plenty of innovation where you're like, wow, that was a completely new way to structure that problem. And you, you pulled a lot of different stakeholders under the same roof. Um, so, so microfinance, where what they did was they, they got a circle of say 50 women, they all know each other. And now they can basically, uh, the human trust of the group, the whole group is going to cover the loan. And really the social factor and social pressure is going to mean that you are way more likely to pay back the loan. Hmm, right. That's super innovative. That's, yes. that's like, holy smokes, innovative. And we're talking about billions of, you know, hundreds of millions of people are, are getting financing through this. There's other people who um, they have software uh, as part of a loan program where they can track where the cell phone goes. And it turns out there's a bunch of statistical factors that say if you show up two or three places with regularity uh, throughout a week, and if you make calls to a, a relatively small number of people frequently, it means you you went home and you went to work, and it means that you had a, a stable social network of probably family, friends, and business associates. So we can give we we can, we can give you a loan now, because we can give a credit score that says you've got a stable job and you've got a stable social life and another life. So all mm -hmm. of those are technology. And, and, and some of those, that's, that's information technology, that second one. The first one would be social tech, social innovation. But like, mm. it's all innovation. That's pretty cool mm -hmm. stuff. Um, I, I just love, I mean, I, I knew, I knew once you got rolling, I just, I just knew you were going to say some eye opening things. A lot of co these concepts too, I just think are just calling out some, uh, some, you know, misinterpreted things in our world that I think are great for our listeners. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Jonathan, just kind of talking back on your entrepreneur, entrepreneurial journey is what has been the, the toughest part of being an entrepreneur and building a business and, and, and what has been the biggest challenge and then what has been the uh, most rewarding part of it? So kind of a two, two, two sided question there. Biggest challenge is financing and resources. I mean, if, if you're doing something unusual, then there's very few people who are doing that thing, right? That's kind of the deal, right? You can either be in a really crowded market or you can be in the weird stuff. And so we, we're kind of dumb. We keep doing market creation. Um, a couple of years into having the company, you know, like, like when you look up these startup entrepreneurship, like first time founder books, they're like, whatever you do, don't do something dumb. Like, 
boil the ocean or take on a ridiculously giant like don't try to like solve universal drinking water as your first company (laughs) (laughs) tell me (laughs) it's like okay let's bite off the let's bite off the biggest thing we can possibly bite off but like literally i read that in more than one book or or online (laughs) like like, oh that was me raise my hand (laughs) so um you know, the, the hardest part is always the resourcing and the financing and like the sheer percentage of my time that I spend just just trying to get financing and, and things of that and trying to get resources. Um, I mean, look, the, the flip side is uh, if you go to a giant well-resourced company, then then the amount of time spent on meetings and information and you you get the collective risk aversion of a large group of people. So if I get if I get a hundred people, I can't possibly have all risk takers. I, I'm supposed to have some risk averse people. Mm. And so large organizations with many departments, you know, large corporations, large large organizations, right? It doesn't matter if it's the United Nations or or if it's uh, you know, Facebook, like you're gonna have some set of people who 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 are risk averse. And so decisions become hard. And see so th- those are just your trade-offs and mm-hmm. you know. Is, is what it is, but it's definitely the resourcing. It's the, it's the hardest bit. Awesome. Awesome. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and did you, did you just to kind of reiterate, what is, what do you think the most rewarding piece of it's been for you? So, so apparently we're going to be running TikTok ads in Bangladesh this month. Okay. <laughs> so, so when I started, uh, we were like, hey, how do we get some social media ads? And like, you know, so we had done 500 startups out in Silicon Valley. And so we we did digital marketing boot camp. And we're like, only one problem. The consumers are not on digital. They're not on <laughs> social media, right? Now you get stuff where people will forward Facebook stuff. Well, now you finally get to the point where like, you know, if somebody can magically for a fraction of a penny deliver a, a customer who wants to pay and who's been educated to your physical store, Right. They'll mm-hmm. pay for that. Procter and Gamble is still one of the number one advertisers in the in the country, right? So is Coca Cola, right? Yep. But by the way, at the bottom of the tech stack, you, you know who pays Google and Facebook's bills? It's Coca Cola and Pepsi and Procter and Gamble. They're the ones who pay for the advertising. Right, right, right. Remember how they're media companies? They're social media companies. Well, the consumer goods companies pay for all of that. <laughs> so, like, we're finally at that point where it's like. Look, we're in 2,000 stores in Bangladesh. What we want to see is, you know, we want to get it to a billion people, which will require, there'll be an acquisition to somebody giant to get it there. But but we're seeing all of that built out. And so every so often you look around and you're like, that was pretty cool. I, something over there happened because I, I have a, you know, we have the subsidiary with the staff of 10 in Bangladesh. And so we industrially manufacture here. Things go there. It gets made into a package. It gets on the store shelf. Somebody does a good job advertising it in a way that, you know, we've got a celebrity doctor and, and, and I wouldn't know to do any of that stuff, right? And it's all being done. And it's being done really professionally. And I'm like, wow, we've got a television commercial that looks really cool. And and they have micro grids. So there are a thousand people. You pay for a television advertisement for 1,000 people that live in this unbelievably tiny geography. Right. I was like, because I was like, why do we have television or a startup? Like, that's a waste of money. They're like, no, 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 a thousand people are going to see that. And they all live within like a couple hundred meters of where the store is. And you're like... Whoa, cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's if hilarious. You're like wherever Bangladesh, you're just like, holy crap. Like imagine if your podcast was only, if you could get a thousand people, but all of them live within a five, a 10 minute drive of where you're sitting right now. And that'd that would be, be nuts. A thousand people would be, would see that. You're like, wow, <laughs> kind of neat. like see you at the coffee shop. Right, right. That's fascinating. We'd be so famous, though, too, if we had like a thousand people within 10 minutes here. Dude, we wouldn't be able to leave the house, okay? Be like, everybody knows us. <laughs> I got a, uh, a future-facing question here for you, and we kind of ask a lot of our entrepreneurs that we bring on this question. Where do you see yourself in full uh, – um, in about five years, like you can answer that personally or professionally. There's no right or wrong answer, but we like to, you know, see how people think into the future and kind of do it in five year increments. Five years is interesting because it's just far enough out that you might have exited and moved mm-hmm. on to your next thing, but it's not far enough out that you know that would have happened. So it's. Uh, a, I'm going to jump in. Sorry to interrupt you. You want to uh, plan for an exit? You want you want to sell? Is that what I'm hearing? The only way to reach global national scale stuff, 
is that you're, you're you're pretty unlikely to scale it. You're pretty likely to to somebody who's really big. Sure. So like the food packaging, I'd love to sell off to a packaging company. Mm. You guys have a bunch of packaging companies in Cincinnati. I will probably see you this year. I'd love to get a coffee or a beer. Dude, absolutely. Like, in all seriousness, you have some $10 billion packaging companies mm -hmm. that could take it and like they could resource it. They could they could develop it over years. They could, you know, the original invention for the plastic susceptor was like 1978 Pillsbury and like 1982 James River Paper Mill in Wisconsin that's now owned by you know, Georgia Pacific, and then it got sold to these guys. And then 40 years later, it's a billion dollar product, that one patent to invention, right? So it's like, I don't want to be around 40 years from now. Like, you know, right. like, so, so I'd love to sell that to one of those companies. And then, and then the water filter ultimately needs to be, you know, Procter & Gamble got out of the water business, uh, as I now know from having lived there. Uh, but, you know, like Unilever, Procter, you know, uh, Reckitt, you know, GlaxoSmithKline, somebody like that. So yeah, I mean the the goal is to to sell it to a company that can go from one corner of the world for these products to to take it international for any of these things. Which right. like look, we're 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 material scientists uh, combined into either global paper pollution, paper plastic solution, or or into a public health solution. Like the goal is to make these things global solutions. Right. The goal is not something in, in uh, we, we we deal at industrial cargo container scale right? we don't deal with anything less <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't get out of bed for 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 a few plastic straws right it, it, <laughs> but wake me when it's it's cargo containers and then okay cool you know a <laughs> uh, cargo containers a, a week you know keeping this uh manifestation or hypothetical going would you prefer that you have a complete exit or would you still like to be involved uh, with your company, or I guess um, at the time it wouldn't be your company any longer, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, with, with category creation of some of this stuff, you figure probably you end up getting pulled in anyway. That's probably, it's probably not realistic, uh, at least for the water filter, but, yeah. but uh, you know, I'm agnostic that once things get far enough along, one of the things that, that, you know, when you talk to founders who've exited or further enough along, one of the, the great joys is that other people take over all those roles, they do a better job, mm -hmm. right? I'm not the only, you know. Like I said, uh, we, we've got a CEO of Fully Water Global, and that's awesome because he knows he's got 20 years of fast-moving consumer goods and grocery retail, and he knows more about that sector in his in his pinky than I do. Mm. Right? <laughs> you know, like I don't need to do that. And then in terms of the inventing, I mean, my my wife's our CTO and does the inventing, but like if we give out a bunch of paper and coding engineers and whatever, like, great. Somebody else could take it. My, my PhD was a uh, billion ton scale CO2 disposal underneath deep sea sediments where the, the CO2 what? goes down and up and is separated away from the deep ocean. So my, my, my company will be carbon sequestration. This is my wife's company. Wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so, so, you know, the idea of pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and shoving it into rocks. Yeah. Those were invented by my PhD advisor. And then putting what? the salts was my other PhD advisors. They were working with like the Amaniophyllites and the, the Icelanders. So, you know, I'm a carbon sequestration guy, but nobody cared about carbon sequestration until very recently. There was zero dollars in it. So, you know. So is that your passion? Would that be your passion? Um, well, uh, water, water, and, uh, water and clean energy. Um, my, my PhD was desalination on the back of pickup trucks in rural Africa and then uh, grid scale thermal energy batteries. And then CO2 disposal underneath deep sea sediments. But, wow. but what I realized was uh, I had to understand. I figured, look, if you invent something that costs, you know, 90% less than whatever's being done now, the greedy capitalists will figure it out, right? Right, right. Well, but that's not true. The market's broken. There, there's no such thing as a consumer good water filter for 20 cents. And, and then the innovative, you know, the innovative American companies are, you know, consumer goods doesn't really have much innovation. So how are you going to launch this new category and who's going to make that happen? So we had to form a company ourselves to, to, to show what that looks like. That's it's awesome. It's incredible. There's like so much stuff you say that I'm just like a lot of it. I'm like, yeah, I get that. And then like, when you started getting to like what your PhD was, I was like, I, I think I'm smart. And I'm just like, I'm trying to follow here, but like, holy shit. <laughs> Oh, dude, like, I'm not gonna act like I know everything. Like, you're very smart. Like, oh, so right. And then he goes, so CO2, and I'm like, what the hell? Look, look, so, so the rule of thumb at, at Columbia was if it's not gonna be 100 million people or a billion people or, or 100 million or a billion tons of CO2, Columbia is an engineering school in New York City, which is like this total paradox in terms. Right. I mean, 
you you you've seen you know, I've got friends at the Ohio State University now, right? That is massive. Like Ohio State is a small a size of a small town. Mm-hmm. So so Columbia, you get like two floors of space, right? Two office office building floor. So you got to be like bleeding edge because the moment you're at. So so the idea is like aim high and if you miss, okay, you know you get get ten million people. Like okay, Dude, okay, like, like, I'm just sure, gonna... like aim high. Like you got to aim high. If you don't aim high and then miss, like. You know, I got. I got to say something to that because I love that, and we're getting a little bit close on time, so I think we might hit some quick hitters. But I, I think you, that comment just kind of made. I just wrapped this this up so beautifully because it to me encompasses your whole journey is aim high, aim high, and have big, big, big dreams. Uh, I'm reading this book right now called Ten X is Easier Than Two X, and it's literally about like one of the first parts of the book. Uh, it's written by Dan Sullivan. Uh, well, he's like one of the contributors. Um, and the other guy's got a PhD in psychology. He's done a lot of different stuff. Um, and I've actually got through the first two chapters. But one of the quotes he calls out, one of the one of the sections, is about aiming, shoot for the stars, and if you, or shoot for the stars. If you land on the moon, you've got you've gotten further than you were, right? Yeah. And I truly, truly, truly believe that you have to have that that big, big, big grand mindset to be able. It's a lot easier to go. And this is one of the concepts, and I think this is what you're getting at, is a lot, I think, easier from a focus standpoint to go, oh, if I if I want to get all the way out there, there's only a few avenues that get me there. But if I only want to go to the other side of the room, there's a lot of ways I can get to the other side of the room, right? There's a million different ways to get there. But if I want to go from here and I want to go all the way, you know, I want to go 50 yards down the street. Everybody wanted us to take the antimicrobial paper and put it inside of somebody else's appliance. Okay. We didn't know all the formalisms at the time. Now I know the formalisms. The formalism is the bill of materials and the cost, the the manufacturing cost of the product, like a few percent of it was the membrane. Most of it's the other stuff. Most of it's the the stuff that holds the water filter. The water filter itself wasn't wasn't much of the overall cost. So you haven't changed the, the retail price point more than a few percent. You haven't really changed things that much. And so when you, I didn't know the formalism, but that's what it is, right? When you want to go from something that costs tens of dollars to pennies, you now have to rethink everything and you have to rethink your distribution. You have to rethink your sales model. You have to rethink your manufacturing, the physical holders. So what we do is, is that the, the low income guy doesn't have to have the container on top of the container underneath. It's, they're already in their house. We don't ask them to go get a special container because that's, that's an appliance purchase just for the plastic pieces. To everybody else, the plastic pieces were already going to require a loan and financing. And, and ask yourself this, how many refrigerators and stoves have you bought this year? Right. And when you go to make a $300 or a $500 purchase, you kind of go like, oh, it's going to be 500 bucks. I want to look into this thing. I'm not sure. Do they have like a payment plan? Like, eh, you know, well, it's the same thing. People are the psychology. That's true everywhere. So we realized we had to rethink everything in selling a water filter for pennies. Now, right now, what we're doing is we're educating the, the packaging world about food quality because our microwave food packaging improves food quality. Mm. It's not on the list of work of jobs to be done by a packaging engineer. Right, right. They're asked about structural stuff. They're asked about shipping. They're asked about did it get did it get there? Did it look nice? Did it have this these very technical functional performance about packaging functionalities? They didn't ask did it make the food better because that's the job of the, of the culinary guy. That's the job of the food guy. Right. Right. And so we're having to connect these dots and rethink things because the goal was this. Well, wait a minute. The industry didn't have, didn't think about it that way. And so we, ha- we have to end up going back to like systems thinking. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's a book called uh, Think Bigger, I think it is. And, and it talks about like Bird's Eye. Uh, Charles Bird's Eye invented flash frozen food as well as the refrigerators, as well as the trucks, as well as the glass door for the frozen food you know bird's eye i just yeah. thought it was a dumb brand it turns out that was like <laughs> a bird's eye like, i love it i love it is the whole supply chain he had to rethink yeah i love it i love it do you want to wrap up with some quick hitters you do the quick hitters you're better at those i'm not good at the quick hitters jonathan i i i try a quick hitter usually and then i ended up like asking seven more questions that aren't quick hitters at all so so yeah we we try to break up our uh our interviews into kind of like three sections and the last section here is just rapid fire questions uh they're usually sometimes silly questions 
Um, but we definitely want to have you back on for a deeper dive. And as you mentioned, if you're in Cincinnati here coming up later on this year, we'll definitely have to grab a uh, coffee or a bite and catch up. But uh, we'll just uh, start off with, do you prefer a day or night? Day these days. All right. These days. So there was a time when you preferred night. It changed. Kind of like Batman. Yeah. <laughs> you like, yeah I, more- I can see it. What twenty twenties versus versus now? I've got a, uh, an almost four year old. So, holy smokes! Congrats, by the way. Well, I guess four, but congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah, congrats. Well, yeah. Is it boy or girl? If I don't let me ask it, little yeah, boy. Yeah. Oh man, that's fun. Super fun. By the way, I I know I do this. Can you try your best Batman voice for me? Because I mentioned it. Can you do it? <laughs> Are you gonna do it or no? He just he just started with his like. His, his Batman stuff. But but you have to realize that when we watch Batman, so we just started this week watching Batman. Okay. But the Batman we watch is the one that's that's for the seven-year-olds from like... Right, right, right. Right? So so Batman's voice is very different than like the... the, the oh, 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 that guy, you know? There it is. Uh, Context matters. I gotta do my Bane. Hold on. What is it? Yeah, what well, is let's his go name? to Ryan Geist next time I'm in town. We have it in the dark. <laughs> we'll go to Ryan Geist. I like oh. the beer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. That was awesome. All right. I needed it. I needed it. Okay. Sorry. Back well, to you. Well, speaking of, speaking of Batman, then, do you have a uh, favorite uh, Batman series or Batman? I know that might be a tough question to answer, too. Oh, these days, the one my, my almost four year old likes. Okay. All right. It, I would have to answer that. Dude, you got to continue. I like, I like the Christopher Nolan series, though. Mm, that's oh, good. Bird, Bird, Birdman. Okay. Yeah. Birdman is the best Batman movie of all time. Okay. All right. Far and away. You've seen it? Uh, I'm terrible with movies. I want to say I have, but I don't entirely Birdman like. I can Mike, watch the movie. Birdman last is time. Michael Keaton. Birdman is Michael Keaton playing Michael Keaton, who used to be Batman. After Batman, now is a billion dollar bestseller. I have seen inside that. of a play where Michael Keaton is playing the, the that character I just told you. That is super confusing. <laughs> Sick. I almost what? got a watch it. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. It, it was all nice it's like, you know, Batman's famous now. And he's like, <laughs> I was nobody. There was nobody. <laughs> no one cares about me. <laughs> I had a super stressful day. So that's what I need. That's what I'm watching tonight. There you go. That's what I'm watching tonight. Do you prefer the the beach or the mountains? Oh, that's why we moved to Boston. You don't have to choose. Okay. Ooh. That's an answer. Okay. I got one last one. Do you prefer heat, hot or cold? Ooh, I prefer being outdoors. Okay. There, there's good things to be done in both. I mean, I'd say sort of in general, uh, you yeah, know, there's good outdoors. What's your favorite? Like if you had to pick, this was the last one. If you had to pick your like most pristine like day, right? What would, like, what would the weather be like? Like what is a perfect day to Jonathan? So, so a perfect day is, uh, can be sunny snowshoeing through like a foot of snow. It could be it could be uh, on the beach with with my three year old. They're Ooh. both the perfect day, but 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 the key part here is in both I'm outdoors. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and it's sunny. <laughs> I really love I really love the snow with the sun because I think we I love snow, but I like you know, and then we'll wrap up. But I cannot stand snow with gray. I like like if you go out to Denver or like Aspen or like out there, it's like you can get in, you know three feet of snow. But the sun's shining. So you're oh, this is great. But then you we were here in Cincinnati mm-hmm. the last two weeks, I think it's been. I looked at a man, I tried to open all our windows in our house, and I'm like, let's get yeah. some sunlight in here. And I'm just like, it's gray light. Like it's not sun like like, we, like it's, it's in, coming through, but it's not sunny. I, I've spent ten years of my life living in Pittsburgh, and that was the Oh thing. yeah, you get it then. Oh, it's gray. You get having it. said that, Pittsburgh has forests in the middle of Pittsburgh. So in my backyard was a two square was a two by two mile forest. Wow. And I lived in the middle of Pittsburgh. And so I used to go snowshoeing in the, the, the forest is right there, right? It's Squirrel Hill and, and Regent Square, that area. And so like you've got this giant ravine in the middle of this forest. I used to go hiking everywhere. Every single day after work, I would go for like an hour long hike in my backyard. Well, with snowshoes, you can go up and down stuff that's crazy steep. So mm-hmm. I just fled down the hill sitting on the back of my snowshoes. Dude, that's wild. That's <laughs> wild. I, I couldn't stand the gray and I got a blue light over there that I highly recommend. Nice. Love it. Okay, sorry. I know I blue like coal. 
Hayden gets really upset when I steal his thunder. Um, that was my question. I was going to ask. Last time, we, last time I did that, I got a call afterwards. So <laughs> I'm sure I'll probably get a talking to, but uh, we'll let it slide tonight. <laughs> But in all seriousness, we appreciate you coming on, Jonathan. Uh, we've learned a ton from you. And seriously, we would love to catch up if you're in town and definitely would like to have you back on sometime in the future too. Uh, so folks listening, check out Fola Materials. Uh, this is Jonathan's company uh, that he's started. They've been around since 2016. They're doing remarkable things, uh, making the world a safer, cleaner, and healthier place to be. Uh, you can check them out at fullamaterials.com. Um, they have a, quite an impressive LinkedIn following as well. I think there are over 3,000 followers. See, I knew I'd find a way to plug that. I was told to do so, Jonathan. And Don, thank you, Don. Yes. Nice work. Well done, that, that was good, right? Don, shout told, out. Told my, my EA has single-handedly like, gotten us his massive social media following. It's, I'm Crushing not underneath these things, so it's amazing. <laughs> we need to connect with them. Yeah, love it, man. Love it. Well, again, thanks again for coming on, and uh, we will connect soon. Thank you, Jonathan. You're the man. Enjoy your night. I know we took some time away, so I appreciate you. Yes, thank you.